Hello and welcome to our first Writers in Conversation of the Year. Um, I am so pleased to have our own Rebecca Smith kicking us off for the season. Um, Rebecca, as most of you, many of you know, is the author of three novels published by Bloomsbury. She's also written two nonfiction books about Jane Austen and writing, and she's written a children's book, What Does She Not Write? Um, as a teaching fellow in English here at Southampton, she's also my colleague and quite a wonderful one, I'll have you know. Um, Rebecca's three novels, The Bluebird Cafe, Happy Birthday and All That, and A Bit of Earth, are precise, close looks at contemporary life. They are still in print from Bloomsbury, which as an author I can tell you is quite a feat, um, and they'll be reissued next year. Rebecca has been a writer in residence at the Jane Austen House, and she's also a five times niece of Jane Austen. These connections led, to, led her to her two nonfiction books. The first, Jane Austen's Guide to Modern Life's Dilemmas, which in addition to being published here, also came out in the USA, Canada, Germany, China, and Russia. Her newest book melds these two passions most clearly into one book, The Jane Austen Writers Club. It's just come out in the UK, Canada, the USA and India, and is coming out in Australia soon as well. Kirkus Reviews has called it a unique tutorial and delicious read. But one of the best quotes I've read of um, a review of Rebecca's books, and there are many, um, was one for one of her novel, The Independent said that Smith shares Jane Austen's clarity and gentle irony. So Rebecca, with that, we would like to hear from the Jane Austen Writers Club. Well, thank you, Carol, and thank you so much. I'm going to just read you a tiny bit, first of all, just from the introduction to the Jane Austen Writers Club, which gives you a little bit of background to the book. Um, the book, it's, um, it's really a book about writing. It's a book about Jane Austen as a writer and about what um, we as writers can learn from her life and from her work. Um, and I'm just going to read you a little bit. Um, I should also say it's beautifully illustrated um, by Sarah J. Coleman, and the illustrations are probably the best bit. But, um, <laughs> I've been following Jane Austen around for a long time. Like so many people, I was introduced to her work at school, Pride and Prejudice, when I was 14, the perfect age. The school was in Dorking, or the town of Dee, as Jane Austen puts it in the Watsons. It was a short walk from Box Hill, site of the disastrous picnic in Emma. I didn't notice any Mr. Darcy's or Mr. Knightley's in Form 4A, but there were plenty of aspiring heroines like Catherine Morland. Pride and Prejudice was one of the first novels for adults that I fell in love with. It transported me from a world of boys who tortured wasps to Pemberley. I remember reading it in the garden of our house, which was in Reigate, not Dorking, in the company of a neighbour's disreputable, frog-killing Ginger Tom. I called him Ginger George Wickham. I'm Jane Austen's five times great niece. It's a nice thing to be, but no claim to fame. Jane Austen's brothers had 33 children between them, so 200 years on, there must be thousands of Austen descendants. And just by the by, I always really hate it when people say Jane Austen descendant, because of course Jane Austen had no descendants. Um, but, you know, Austen family descendant, but there are thousands of us, too many probably for people to count anymore. Um, but when I visited my great aunt in Winchester, I loved looking at some little portraits of Jane Austen's sailor brothers, Francis, my ancestor, and Charles, and what turned out to be a rare depiction of her father, the Reverend George Austen. These portraits are now on display at Jane Austen's House Museum in Chawton, Hampshire, so I can visit them there. I went to university here in Southampton and still live here in the city. There are still traces of the Southampton that Jane Austen knew when it was her home before she finally settled at Chawton. The sea has been pushed back from, once it from where it once came up to the city walls so that she could see it from the garden she created with Frances' family, her sister Cassandra and her mother. Um, and there's a lovely bit in her letters about um, some of her nephews came to stay. Um, she spent a lot of her time looking after her nephews and nieces and um, a couple of the boys came to stay when their mother had just died and her sisters-in-law um, had so many children and also like so many women of the time um, 
often died after childbirth. Anyway, these two boys came to stay and the sea came right up to the walls and um, they made paper boats and they'd collected conkers and their favourite game was to bomb these paper boats <laughs> with the conkers, um, which has a sort of lovely but strange irony, seeing as um, the um, two of the uncles were away at sea all the time. Um, anyway, she liked the city. Uh, there was and is so much more to it than the stinking fish mentioned in Love and Friendship. From 2009 to 2010, I had the immense good fortune to be the writer in residence at Jane Austen's House Museum. I reread all Jane's works and her letters and had a wonderful year with the staff and volunteers, talking to visitors, running writing workshops, visiting schools, generally getting lost in Austen and working on my fifth novel. On Jane Austen's 234th birthday, 16th December 2009, I was the, one of the first in the house. I remember going to open the shutters in Jane's bedroom and desperately hoping that I might catch a glimpse of her. I didn't, but this book had its genesis in that year. Spending so much time where Jane Austen lived, where she wrote Mansfield Park, Emma and Persuasion and revised her three earlier novels, walking where she did and seeing the views from her windows was magical and inspiring. The museum isn't haunted, but many of the staff, volunteers and visitors testify to its healing atmosphere. I've now run many writing workshops at Jane Austen's House Museum and elsewhere, using Jane's work and methods to inspire writers working in all genres. I'm so grateful to the museum for the opportunities it's given me and to the writers who have come to the workshop sharing their writing, ideas and experiences. I thought of those writers when I was working on this book and I was thinking of my students too. I hope it'll be useful to them and to writers around the world who love Jane Austen or who are less familiar with her work, to readers, teachers and Jane Knights everywhere. I hope this book will help you too, whether you're writing a novel, concentrating on short stories or working in another form. People love Jane Austen's work for so many reasons. The comedy, her, sparking di her sparkling dialogue, the unforgettable characters, the accuracy of her observations, her neat and satisfying plots, her use of language, the way she writes relationships and how she captures what it is to be in love, bullied, wrong, disappointed, to be part of a family, the list goes on and on. Her let us give us wonderful insights into her life and in them she gives advice on writing. I tried to include that too. One of the most difficult aspects of writing the book was deciding which extracts to use and then having to limit their length. And I had lots of conversations with the um, kind editor at Bloomsbury saying um, how much we needed to keep cutting, keep cutting, keep cutting. And of course, I didn't want to cut anything, but of course, we couldn't have the entirety of her work in the book. Um, and what I'm really hoping for the book is that, um, that it'll be useful and also that it'll send people back to Jane's novels because I think as a writer that's just one of the best places to go. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I know you're the great, 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 great niece of Five. Jane Austen. Five, yeah. Um, and you know you can say lots of people um, are related to her in, in the end. However, to an American, that's still impressive. <laughs> have to say. Um, but okay. But aside from that, why Jane? I mean, here you're a, a contemporary novelist. You write about current British life. Why Jane Austen? Um, well, she was one of the first writers whose work I really fell in love with, and um, I think that I was at an age when I was starting to really appreciate the way a really good novel for adults and the way novels work. Although I'd been lucky to grow up um, in a family that loved books and always been given lots of books and my mum's a writer and so um, it wasn't that reading was new to me but I, I guess Pride and Prejudice really touched my heart and my mind as well, I suppose, in a, in a new way. And, and I think the experience of studying it at school was actually very good too. Um, nowadays when um, children are at school in, and as teenagers, there are very few novels that they actually study the whole thing of. Um, and very often, I remember my daughter coming home saying, oh, they were doing Northanger Abbey, it meant they were doing a tiny extract. But there's such a wonderful experience of studying a whole novel, I think, when you're of the right age for it. Mm. Um, her 
I just love the way her fiction works, um, the way that she constructs her plots in such a really pleasing manner. There are instances where, of course, there are things that seem like you know, big coincidences, but she can get away with them in fiction, you know, that um, Mr. Darcy's aunt happens to be the employer of Mr. Collins and Lizzie's um, aunt Gardner happens to be from the village where, but she gets away with it and just the beautiful neatness of the plots. I think also she writes um, about things that still matter so much to people. Um, she was a real pioneer in the way um, that she used free and direct narration, which is really important stylistically, but also really important in the way that we, um, that she understood the way her characters worked, she understood what her characters wanted, she understood just the workings of the human heart. She was a very psychologically astute novelist. Um, and the characters that she drew, nowadays people are looking at them and able to sort of diagnose them using the most current um, terms used in psychology. So, and I think that's why her novels have remained so popular. Mm -hmm. And can you talk a bit more about, I think you mentioned that you were teaching somewhere and there were um, Muslim students who had a particular um, like connection with them. Um, Can you talk about yeah, that? Yeah, no, um, I think when I went to Brunei, which I was incredibly lucky, um, there, there was a while, I kept getting these emails, um, this is a couple of summers ago, and the subject line was always, greetings from this tropical paradise. <laughs> and um, so of course I wasn't opening them, and um, hello from this beautiful land, and let us welcome you, and all this stuff, not opening them. And then one day one of them, and I, I was noticing the same name. And one day it said something about Jane Austen. I thought, oh, maybe I should open this one. And it was an invitation to go to Brunei where um, they were um, some school students and their teachers and um, a lady who's turned into a really good friend of mine, um, Zeti, was putting on the country's first ever adaptation of a Jane Austen novel. And um, they wanted people to come and they'd sort of they'd seen what I'd done as writer in residence at Jordan and invited me and I went and it I was so impressed with not just the production but the students there who were growing up in a Muslim country and the work of Jane Austen just chimed with them so much um, probably because they a lot of them were growing up in family situations that were really similar in a way to the ones that the sort of strictures on some of the Jane Austen, on the Jane Austen um, young women in particular. Um, and, but I could really see how it just translated across the globe. And I mean, lots of filmmakers have seen that too with things like Bride and Prejudice and all that stuff. Mm. Yeah. Mm. But I, I think it does have this wonderful resonance with people. Um, and because she writes so much, not just about mm. falling in love and all that kind of stuff, but um, about family life and, you know, having um, embarrassing parents and having, um, you know, being part of a big family where um, your sisters drive you crazy, all that kind of stuff. She does so well. Mm -hmm. Now, I know your book sort of looks very carefully at certain elements of fiction, and you've talked about um, her plotting, which indeed sort of feels mostly invisible, um, but, but is quite tight. So, um, but could you talk maybe about um, one or two other elements of fiction that, that you sort of trace her use of in, in your book? Maybe writing dialogue? For yeah, example. yeah. Um, she was a wonderful writer of dialogue and I know I'm preaching to the converted here, um, but I think she had a real love of the theatre and if you read her scenes um, and the way she uses dialogue, that love and understanding of the theatre really comes across. Um, a, re a particularly wonderful scene is the one where Lady Catherine comes to try and bully Lizzie Bennet into promising not to marry Mr Darcy. And if you, you can really follow the stage directions of when people stand up, when they sit down, um, the sort of setting where Lady Catherine takes Lizzie off into this pretty little wilderness so that she has her alone. Um, and also the work is just so full of jokes as well. I think also because um, women in particular in Jane Austen's time were so limited in what they could do, the dialogue is even more important. They couldn't 
um, so so much happens through the dialogue and she really uses it to move her plots forward too and I think she's so endlessly quoted from just because so much of it is so funny but also some of it is so beautiful if you think of um, for instance Captain Wentworth's proposal to Anne the words are just so you know I have loved none but you you pierce my heart all this wonderful stuff um, it really amuses me that people tend to quote Mr Darcy's first proposal to Elizabeth which of course was the one that went on to be so rude that she turned him down you know um, but there, there's so much in it yeah and, and how does a um, uh, someone writing today, uh, a new writer, not, you know, uh, how do they learn from that without sounding like Jane Austen? Because we wouldn't yeah. necessarily uh, yeah. agree. I wouldn't want any of my students to put piercing your heart in, yeah. into their dialogue. I love them, but you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, I'm they, sure they that could, work. I don't know they could say that. Unless um, they're being ironic. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think if you look at the way she renders the dialogue for her different characters, if you look at Sense and Sensibility, for instance, and the characters of Lucy and Anne Steele, the two sisters, um, and look at the way she writes those, there's a huge difference in the way those two girls speak. Um, Lucy, who's the clever, manipulative social climber, and then her sister Anne, who sort of betrays their roots and um, uses... Um, you can really, also you can really hear the Devon accent as well. Um, although we know from Jane's spelling that she had a Hampshire accent. You know, she's a good Hampshire lass herself. Mm -hmm. um, so you you see how she did the different voices for different characters. Um, her niece Anna, Jane's niece Anna, was a novelist or aspiring novelist too, and um, would send Jane. Um, her work in the same sorts of little booklets that Jane herself used. So they sold paper in big sheets like this and would make their own little notebooks stitching them together and Anna would post her work in progress and then Jane would send it back and luckily some of the letters have survived where Jane's giving Anna directions about, you know, and says I've scratched out this and one thing she picks out is one of the characters would Oh, I can't remember the exact. He'd never say "bless my soul" or something like that. And there's a real precision in the words that she chooses for each character. Mm -hmm. But you also see these real power plays between the characters too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, Rebecca and I have plotted um, that she's going to read from one of her a bit from one of her own novels, and then talk about how that particular bit was influenced by, by okay. Jane. So. Okay. Okay. I've got two little extracts. Um, they're both very short. Um, this first one is from my novel Happy Birthday and all that. Um, and it was strange when I was looking back at them, because of course I wrote these before I was the writer in residence at Chawton, but Jane Austen had always been a, a big influence on me. And it's interesting now sort of looking back, but of course there are so many other influences on me as well. You know, it's not that she's the only writer I love. There are many. So this is from quite early on in the book, and the book follows the year in the life of a family. Um, and this is from August. The novel starts in August and goes around to the following July. Um, the family are called the Paracellis, and in my mind, they lived on First Down Road, which lots of you will know is just on the other side of the campus. Um, and it's Posey and Frank, and they have four children. And the youngest Izzy is a baby, and they haven't gone away on holiday this year, so they're just stuck in Southampton, which is hot and dusty this summer. Um, and in this little bit, we have a sort of flashback to where um, Posey, who's one of the central characters, it goes back to where she used to go and stay with her great aunts in Winchester. Um, the grass on the common was studded with cigarette butts and turning to yellow dust, but the Paracelli still went there nearly every day. They hadn't been away this year. Izzy was too young for a holiday to be a holiday. Oh, August, low season for fates, bazaars and jumbles. Posy was getting withdrawal symptoms. Her love of them was genetic. Her mother had been on the school's PTA and would do the bookstall or the white elephant, something that didn't require her to make anything. Aunt Iz was a queen of fates. Every weekend there seemed to be one. Her friend Beatrice, known to the girls as Aunt B, made felt animals and they donated honey for sale. If they weren't manning a stall, then they would take their young visitors to somebody else's open garden, or at the very least to the WI market for a haul of jam and cakes. Tuck in, tuck in, girls, they'd say, words to gladden any heart. 
The girls often stayed with aunties in the holidays. The time dragged. Aunties lived in St Cross, in a house overlooking the water meadows. Sometimes the girls would walk along Kingsgate Road and into Winchester. If they were, there, if they were, were by themselves, they would go into Bluebells, their favourite shop, and buy the sorts of things that their aunt thought utterly pointless. Smelly rubbers, magnetic cats, mini dried flower paperweights, flower fairy notebooks and pens, things they thought necessary to their happiness. Utter junk, aunt I said. Lot of nonsense, no use to anyone. These opinions didn't stop her from decamping to Cornwall to help Aunt Bee run the North Cornwall Bee Centre with its own gift shop and cafe some years later. Posey and Flora tried to make the walks as long as they could, visiting any museum that was free, looking in the charity shops, stopping to listen to any busker or street entertainer who didn't look liable to involve them or embarrass them. They patted the bronze, bear near the bronze boar near the courts. They browsed, pointless, pointless, the Tourist Information Bureau. They would even look at whatever exhibition the Guild Hall was sporting, the Guild of Embroiderers, Rotary Regalia. The citizens of Winchester seemed oblivious to the prison on the hill and went about their hunter-booted business as though it wasn't there, about to slide down on the lava flow and engulf them all. Flora and Posey sat on the steps of the Buttercross and drank coke. They sat on benches in the cathedral close and read and read. Sometimes there was a film crew working on an adaptation. They hoped that they might be spotted. We'd be great as Elizabeth and Jane Bennett, Flora said, even though Posey hadn't done Pride and Prejudice yet and was doomed to get Mansfield Park for O-Level. But I bet we'd end up as Mary and Kitty. Aunt Iz always took them on a tour of the cathedral. She was an official guide and on duty at least twice a month. The high point of their visit would be a trip to the Theatre Royal, where they would eat ice cream in the interval and never ever go to the bar. Much of the time was spent taking the dogs to the water meadows. They liked to walk past a house where a parrot called Persephone lived. The girls stopped and peered. Persephone's owner waved, but never invited them in. So that's a little bit um, just of my two um, central female characters when, when they were girls in Winchester. I think, um, I thought I'd read that bit just because it had a little bit of reference to Jane Austen. And when I was flicking through the book today, just um, choosing which bit to read, I was really pleased to see that I'd put at the end, um, something terrible happens in the family. Um, and, um, and one of them at the end says, points out that um, things that are messy and awful also happen in Jane Austen, which of course they do. Um, what I was hoping readers would get out of that bit was something that the girls themselves don't know, that of course they're thinking of Pride and Prejudice, but the, what I was really thinking of when I created them, you know, one of the many things, was of course Sense and Sensibility and Eleanor and Marianne. And I thought a lot about Sense and Sensibility when I was coming up with these two sisters, because Flora, who is incredibly um, organised and she runs a business called Perfect Solutions, which is um, to put people's lives in order. Um, and then Posey, who's married and has got four children and um, just has been sort of going, sort of dreaming through life, really. I mean, they're not really Eleanor and Marianne, but the same sort of thing. And I, I sort of thought that my reader would obviously, they'd be, the girls here are talking about Pride and Prejudice and Mansfield Park, but of course they're really yeah. um, Eleanor and Marianne. And the other thing that I think I really learnt from Jane Austen, and particularly from Emma, was her... Um, wonderful use of settings but my favourite passage I think in all perhaps in all of Jane Austen is a bit where Emma stands um, in the doorway of Ford's at the, the shop at the centre of the village and just looks out of the window and um, observes what's going on and you know it's a tidy old woman coming home from market and um, some children looking in the shop window at some gingerbread um, and just um, these little details of life at the centre of Highbury. And that was quite revolutionary at the time to be writing in that realist way. But what she also does in that scene is um, in her use of point of view, Emma's standing there and then she sees Frank Churchill coming along and says, and Mrs Weston and um, Frank Churchill come along and Emma, th 
and Emma thinks to Highbury, of course. Um, but of course, they're actually going to visit Jane Fairfax. And um, but she just slips that sort of thing in so subtly. Mm. Um, and it's only when the reader. Um, at the end of the book or rereading it the reader will see that of course that was just Emma being completely deceived and I, I loved uh, I loved the use of of the village and the way that um, you know that sly sort of observation but also the attention to the place mm -hmm. which I think was so important yeah um, it struck me too that the way um, the aunt is characterized um, seems to me a bit Jane Austen like or that the, the two girls are thinking one thing and the ant comes sort of loudly so yeah. to sort of discount it. That seemed to me, that sort of thought and interchange seemed to me a bit like that as well. Yeah, maybe. Um, the, the aunt in this is really, she's really kind. Um, this And they're not them at all, they're completely different, but it was inspired a bit by my great aunts who uh -huh. lived in Winchester, the ones who had the miniatures yeah. and so on and so forth, and the sort of visits my sisters and I, and then when I was a student I'd go and visit them by myself. Mm -hmm. But it's all changed and completely different and yeah. and so on but yes and I think um, Jane Austen said um, talks about the importance of aunts in her letters and I, I love all those family relationships I love writing about that sort of thing um, and the importance of aunts and uncles and mm -hmm. Right. The other thing that I think, um, or one of the things I think I really took from Jane Austen's work, um, was the way that, one thing that I particularly love about it, and of course this is something that loads of writers do, but um, it's very easy to see in Jane Austen's work, is the way that she will take a theme and play it out in lots of different ways. And this is what I mean about the neatness of her plots. And she will have these parallel characters and parallel storylines, you know, whether it's so obvious as in Sense and Sensibility, um, or the way that she will use, say, um, different sets of siblings. Um, in Mansfield Park, for instance, there are just so many wonderful parallels and reflections set up so that the reader will constantly be comparing and contrasting the destinies of these different characters and the way people will react to the same situation. Um, in Emma, of course, she has the way the um, she's looking very much at um, what is life like for a single woman and contrasting, you know, for Emma, who is rich, for Miss Bates, um, who, of course, is poor, um, for Jane Fairfax, for Harriet, you know, the position of all these women in the same society with or without money and their different destinies. And I love the way she has these sort of matching pairs or something, sometimes trios of characters, so that it will be the way she looks at the cousins, say, in Mansfield Park, and the way she'll look at different siblings. And with Mansfield Park, she sets it up right from the very first paragraph, where she talks about Fanny Price's mother and her two aunts. And so just by establishing that from the very beginning, she's setting up these sort of wonderfully these sort of beautiful patterns really within her novels and I really love that and I was going to and this is that's something that I whether consciously or not I, I guess I realize that I'm doing it but I don't I don't it sort of happens um but with um a bit of earth it's a novel that's really about loss and about grief and what I wanted to do in it was um it's a novel as I was boring my students with this afternoon <laughs> about um, about sort of worst fears realised or in this case second worst fears realised you know your greatest fear as a parent is that your child will die um, and then your second fear is that you will die and then who will look after them and it's sort of exploring that um, and it's very much a novel about loss so in in this novel um, there's Guy whose wife has died the mother Susanna, the mother of Felix, and but the parallel character is Judy, who's um, a history of art lecturer at the university, and she's also had this terrible loss in her own life. She was in love um, with this visiting lecturer who was called Eduardo, who'd come um, from Chile just before the coup and so on, and he's disappeared in just the same way that Guy's wife, Susanna, has disappeared, and I wanted to look at those um, sort of different experiences, but also very similar experiences of the same thing and the way that people come together and so on. 
and I was going to read you a bit about um, about Judy's loss, and then I thought it's just so depressing and bleak. I thought I'd read you a little bit from afterwards. Um, so in the bit before this, which I'm not going to read you, Judy, um, the reader's just been finding out about. Um, about how Judy had lost Eduardo, and she hasn't just lost Eduardo, but she lost. Um, he, so he goes back to Chile, and then is one of the disappeared, and um, and he doesn't know that she's pregnant when she goes back, and then she loses the baby, and be a sadist, pile it on, you know, yeah. how, which, um, uh, that's what Kurt Vonnegut said, you know, be a sadist. And it's, you have to make really bad things happen to your characters, or sometimes you have to make very bad things almost happen to your characters, and that can be just as good in fiction. Um, so poor Judy, so she lost Eduardo, then she loses the baby, and now this is a good 30 or so years on, um, and she's a history of art lecturer, and she's sitting in the botanical garden, which is, as I hope you will all go and visit if you haven't already, just down the hill from here. Judy sat in the botanical garden, on the bench underneath the banana tree, wondering why she didn't come here more often. What a strange and neglected place it was. Really, the university and the students were missing out. Here it was, a beautiful little oasis of tranquillity, completely silent apart from the birds and really only yards from the campus. She should encourage the nicer ones for her students to come here, but not too many of them. How easily it could be spoiled if it turned into a place to chat on one's mobile or to party, or if the university realised the wonderful asset it had and started to use it for receptions and so on. She remembered coming here with Eduardo. It had been a much more popular place when she was young. Eduardo had been disappointed by the campus. She thought he must have been expecting something a bit more historic, at least a few dreaming spires and some punts, a river for late night naked swimming. The best they could offer him here were some red brick buildings, some interesting 1950s architecture and good train links to London. The botanical garden made up for the rest of the place, at least a little. The lightest of winds made the bamboo whisper and creak and lifted the corners of the essays that she was pretending to grade. She had on her tinted spectacles. The air was very warm for October. She was sitting between two hawthorn trees and trying to remember which one of them was pink and which one white. Judy could never decide which she liked better, the pink may blossom or the white. The same went for lilac, purple or white. But then why should one have to decide? Why, she wondered, had it been considered such bad luck to bring lilac into the house, also cow parsley? Both were supposed to portend a death, or even to cause one. She would look it up. She knew that if she closed her eyes, she would be instantly asleep. She sat so still that the frogs in the pond returned to the surface and remained there. A pair of goldfinches were already feeding on the niger seed that she had put on the bird table. She had bought it at the hardware shop for her own garden. It had seemed selfish not to bring some in her pocket and put it out here. Now she would feel it necessary to return regularly to replenish it. How warm the sun was. She would just close her eyes for a moment. She felt a, she felt a very slight chill, a shadow passing across her papers. She opened her eyes and a boy was standing there. For a moment she thought that he might be a shade of some sort, a ghost. He was very pale, and he must have come up to her so silently that the frogs had not noticed his approach and plopped back beneath the surface. Judy saw that if this were a ghost, it was one with rather grubby knees. He was wearing a school sweatshirt, the cuffs of which were frayed and hung in damp and stringy fringes around his bony wrists. His hair was a bit stringy around the ears too, in need of a good trim. He was carrying a long stick of bamboo. Hello, said Judy. The boy smiled. Judy knew that smile. It seemed to stop her heart for a moment. This, she thought, must be Susanna and Guy Misselthwaite's little boy. Would you like to see the newts, he asked. Yes, please. She was glad to see that he hadn't come armed with a jam jar and a string. She could not possibly have condoned newt catching, or even temporary newt catching, even for a school project. He led her down a very small path into the copse, ignoring the notices warning that this area was crumbling and that there was a danger of further landslips, past some rather nasty azaleas, and then across a little stream where some of the pebbles were coated with a coppery deposit. Here was the pool. Here, said Felix, this is where they live. Nobody knows except me. Thank you, she whispered. I shan't tell anybody. You have to keep very still and then you'll see them. 
they squatted down and kept very still. There were oak leaves in the pool, water boatmen, some unusual looking snails, she would have to look those up too, and there, with their tails looking as though they'd been snipped from some of the fallen oak leaves, were the newts. Wow, she whispered, I've never seen so many together before. Even my dad doesn't know they're here. I don't think anyone does. They watched in silence for a while as the newts went about their business. When I was a little girl, we sometimes had newts in a tank at school, but they're very rare now. I think we should leave them alone, don't you? Judy was very against the modern practice known as pond dipping, whereby children were encouraged to scoop out anything they could, plonk it in some shallow plastic tray where the water temperature would quickly rise beyond that of the pond, leave the creatures there for as long as they like to be prodded and remarked upon, and then perhaps tip the water and most of, most of its inhabitants back. Who knew what tinies might be left behind, their element evaporating forever? He who torments the chafer's sprite weaves a bower in endless night, she told herself. I'm not going to catch them, said Felix. Neither am I. They watched the newts for some more minutes. I've seen you in the garden before, Felix told her. Well, you're very clever, said Judy, because I've never seen you. I can climb very tall trees and I know secret places, but I'm usually at school. Does anybody know you're here? Judy couldn't stop herself from asking. Perhaps the boy had absconded from the after-school club to find his dad. She'd seen the children being shepherded, rather carelessly, she thought, from the school to the church hall by some students in nasty maroon polo shirts. Perhaps he was on the run from, from some team games, perhaps from some after-school bullies. You had to take your hat off to him, really. My dad's in charge of the garden, Felix told her. That's wonderful, she replied. It's such a lovely garden. I wasn't sure anyone was in charge of it at all. He's certainly doing a very good job. What's his name? Guy, said Felix. My name is Judy Lovage. What's your name? Felix Peter Misselthwaite. Peter is spelt in Swedish. My mum was half Swedish. Yes, said Judy. Well, Felix Peter Misselthwaite, I'm very pleased to meet you. She extended her hand and smiled. Felix, Felix looked at it for a second and then realised he was meant to shake it. I knew your mummy, said Judy. I thought she was very beautiful and kind. Really? Did you really? Yes. We often saw each other in the library where she worked. Oh, said Felix. Judy wished she had something a bit more precise or detailed or meaningful to add. She loved you very, very much, she said. I have to go now, said Felix. And he ran towards one of the greenhouses where a silhouette that must have been his father was sitting very still. So. This is our last Jane Austen question. We're going to ask you more mm. questions. So, what, what what were you taking from from her with that? Was that the idea of those like parallel stories? Of yeah, parallel yeah, sort of yeah, off? yeah. Those sort of parallel plot lines, yeah. and I think also the point of view thing. But people. I've sometimes been into schools and um, had students say to me, of course Jane Austen hated children, but of course she didn't. But she was very good at writing very badly behaved children. Um, so I guess that's a difference for me because I wanted to have Felix as this central character um, who everything in the book really revolves around him. And it's he who, um, he doesn't intend to, but he does, who's bringing people together. And it's his future that's so important in the book and Guy is a bit of a he's a dreadful person to have as a hero if you follow things like the hero's story because he's so um, inactive and it takes him almost the whole book to just wake up um, and realise what he should be doing um, but of course he's grief stricken too um, so I guess that was something different I was doing as well Yeah. Can you talk about when you know you have a story in your head that's going to become a novel? Um, I think all writers have full starts and that's fine. Um, I, one of the novels that I was sort of meaning to write but haven't was to, there were, uh, there's a couple of very minor characters in, um, have, what's it called? A Bit of Earth, two of the students and they're going off to, um, Seattle at the end of the book and I wanted to follow them and I was going to take them to Alaska which is another place I've always wanted to go to but somehow I never have and I think writers do you sort of have ideas and think oh that would make quite a good novel and somehow you don't write it um, I think that's what happened to Jane Austen with the Watsons you you 
you know, maybe a better idea comes along. Um, I think the ideas for the ones that will really turn into the novel, the ones that just stay with you and sort of nag at you and you just feel compelled to write that story and even if it takes you a long time. Um, but of course it changes a lot as you're working. So what starts out as being a novel about one thing will easily become a novel that's actually about something else and characters that you don't have at the beginning might come in and um, become much more central characters. Uh, can I ask another Jane Austen question? Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think are Jane Austen's uh, weaknesses and limitations as a writer? Um, well, I have to say, first of all, that I'm not, like so many of my colleagues, a proper academic Austen expert, and I'm just coming at this as a writer and enthusiast. Um, I think she... But I don't... First of all, I don't think you should expect one writer to be everything and to do everything perfectly because they're just one individual. Um, so you can't, you know, a writer might, you might think, oh, why didn't she write about this? Why didn't she write about that? Um, I think there are things that she's sometimes accused of as having limitations, for instance, not writing much about current events or war, which she actually did, if you think about, you know, the characters in her novels and um, the reason everything goes so badly wrong in Mansfield Park um, is because um, Fanny's uncle is off in, um, in the West Indies attending to his plantations and he's a slave owner and if he hadn't been doing that and he'd been at home, perhaps, you know, not everything would have gone wrong. I think it's such a tragedy that she died so young because it would have been so interesting to see what she went on and did. Um, and in Sanderton, I think she was starting to write a different sort of novel. And had she lived a bit longer, and certainly if she'd lived as long as her brother Francis, and you know, well into the time of the railways, I think she would have done a lot more and done different things. Um, I think Emma as a character, who I love as a character, but she is pretty impressive for a 21-year-old. Um, and perhaps she's sort of Jane Austen herself um, in the body of, uh, of a much younger person. I don't, what do you think? I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So invested in her work. Yeah, you yeah. Was, yeah. I'm not yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think as a writer, and this is something Jane herself would say, um, if you, there's her famous defence of the novel in Northanger Abbey, and she says, you know, if we writers don't stand up for each other, who will? Um, so I don't actually like <laughs> pointing out shortcomings in other writers' work. Um, I've been asked to do this podcast where you have to talk about two books that you love and one book that you hate, and that's giving me real problems. I can think of some books that I hate, but I don't, I don't particularly want to go on the record talking about a book that I hate, although I have got one in mind. <laughs> yeah. But um, So... Um, of, of course she was very much of her time, but she, of course she was, we all are, and we don't, often when we're writing, we don't have any idea about, you know, mistakes that we might be making, um, or things that we could possibly do differently. Even now, looking, just flicking through the books, um, I can just see all these real howlers, and I'm hoping Bloomsbury will give me a chance to <laughs> rewrite them, you know, before they're reissued. There are definitely lots of things I'd change. Um, I think Persuasion has shortcomings. I think that she finished it, we know that she finished it hastily, and she substituted the chapter um, at the end, where, and I think that definitely smacks of... Um, dissatisfaction on the part of the author and there are important plot things in that with um, William Elliot and Mrs Clay and their scheming which just isn't really properly developed and it's just sort of quickly dealt with at the end. I think, I don't think it was properly finished. I think she was getting ill and she probably would have done more to it and it would have been as perfect a novel as Emma. So I think that's probably one of her, but yeah. Yes. Um, you mentioned earlier that in a bit of earth you um, set it all outside. So um, why did you make that decision? Um, I didn't quite manage to do it all outside in the end, but what happened was my second novel, um, Happy Birthday and all that, um, 
it's so terrible that women are often criticised for writing domestic novels and then a man writes a novel that's all about family life and no one bats an eyelid. Um, but I suppose that I was conscious of having done this very domestic novel, but I love writing about families, and, you know, why not? Um, but I did want to do, I wanted to sort of do something really different. So I thought, okay, maybe what I'll do is just have it completely outside. Um, and I was thinking a lot about gardens and thinking, um, a lot about A Midsummer Night's Dream as well and when I started writing it I was going to make it much more equivalent in a way the, the plot works to A Midsummer Night's Dream but um, actually another writer a book came out <laughs> doing that just as I not set in Southampton in Italy um, while I was working on it so I kind of scrapped that idea but the Midsummer Night's Dream carried thing carried on being really important um, so I think I just wanted to have the sort of theatre of the garden and um, and just sort of think about what could happen in just this really small bit of earth, really. And I think I was also thinking about, I did biology A-level, and one of the things I really loved was when we went on field trips, and I expect lots of you did the same, and you have these sort of quadrant things, and you sort of throw it down, and then you have to count how many limpets are in it, and how many this, and how many that. And you're just sort of looking at what's in this little square. Um, there are these artists I love, um, the Boyle family, who I think I've been thinking about as well and they did the same sort of random thing of throwing down these you know sort of putting a pin in a map and going see what happens here and I think as a writer it's that um, just wanting to examine one place really closely and sort of imagine what can happen in that one place um, but I do love outdoors for someone who loves gardens I'm actually a very bad gardener with um, and a very lazy gardener but I like writing about them <laughs> um. Did you, how do you, that, you know, we're talking about your novels, but then you've you just published a nonfiction book. Is, is there a different process for you in, in writing nonfiction versus fiction? Um, sort of yes and no. Um, Non-fiction is easier, that is absolutely certain. Um, and I, I'm sure students will find the same, you know, if you've got to write or maybe not. If you've got to write an essay and it's got to do very particular things and a very particular word limit, somehow that seems easier to me. Um, and in a way, this book was, it was easy to write because I'd already done lots of workshops and I kind of knew the stuff that I was using. Um, whereas with fiction, the decisions that you're making are often much harder to make. And you will, I think you can feel more, much more certain of what you're doing with nonfiction. There's fewer, yeah. um, there's many more possibilities with fiction. Yeah, exactly. You do anything. Yeah. yeah. And um, where, where nonfiction, you do sort of, there's more of a structure. Of yeah, structures. yeah. And I sort of knew with the, um, with the latest Jane book that I, you know, I wanted to cover certain bases and I wanted to make sure that I was doing enough about character and within character I wanted to write about how she uses clothes and how she does this and how she does that. Um, whereas with fiction it's much more um, of this step into the unknown, although I'll often know the ending of a story before I write it. Um, apart from my first novel I think I've always, I always seem to know the endings now and that does make it much easier, but you have no idea how you're actually going to get to that place. Yeah. It's, a, it's a long journey from mm. knowing the ending to getting to yeah. the ending. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, other questions? Yes. In the Jane Austen Writers Club, you give lots of wonderful advice and um, sort of permeated from the great lady herself. Was there any advice as a writer that, although you can give it, is actually quite hard to follow itself? <laughs> all of it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all of it. yeah. Um, I think the hardest advice to follow is always, for me, the advice about working habits and so on. Um, I actually used to be more disciplined, I think, a few years ago when my children were younger and I had less time in terms of getting up early. Um, but now when actually it would be easier to, 
I don't. So I'm, I'm not nearly as disciplined as I should be. About I mean, I, I tend to get stuff done in the end, but I think I do feel I could get a lot more done than I do. Um, but I hope, I hope the advice is all sound advice. I think all writers, um, you know, don't, you know, I think no one ever feels that they're doing enough or that they're working hard enough. And that's the terrible thing about a life. I mean, it's a wonderful and I'm really lucky, but a life where your life is your work and your work is your life. Um, and you realise that your working life um, just impinges on your family life and um, so even when you go on holiday you love to write but really you you know it's it's a it's a tricky sort of way of leading a life but a very nice one as well yeah yes I find your fiction very emotional um, Rebecca and oh. I wondered what emotions you are feeling when you're writing for example if you're writing a scene which has a lot of um, sadness in it are you experiencing the sadness yourself, or are you very detached from it? Um, I'm really sorry. I didn't actually realise people were sitting there, and I've just talked with my back to you the whole time. I'm really sorry. I hadn't quite twigged that there were people right there. I'm really sorry. Um, I, some of it I do. Um, so I try not to do it too completely cynically. Um, the bit where there's a bit in the book where Felix... Um, in a bit of earth where he's doing all these things to try and make his mum come back and I was um, and I did get quite upset when I was doing that because I think I was writing the book because I was thinking you know thinking about you know just how awful it would be you know for a child without their mother and you know what it would be like for my kids and sort of imagining the awful and um, maybe they, there's one here maybe he'd be pleased I don't know um but um the awfulness of that situation so I do get quite you know I'm sort of but I think there's also something really horrible about writers in that um you you're doing it for effect, aren't you? And you, you, if people tell me that they cried and cried, I'm pleased. <laughs> because that's what I wanted it to do. Um, so you want it to work, but I'd, you wouldn't do it unless you were, um, unless you really cared about it. Um, Rebecca West said the tosh horse is never ridden tongue in cheek. And um, I think that whatever kind of writing you do, you have to really care about it and really believe in it um, you know whether you're writing romances or um, literary fiction or historical or whatever it is so sort of both but I think so probably you'd be really upset when you were actually well not really upset because obviously you're writing it but you'd be sort of feeling the feelings more as you're imagining the scene and then writing it um, but then you step back with your steely editors I know you know <laughs> what it's like tomorrow as well um, you just step back and um, do everything you can to then just make that as effective as possible can, can you talk a bit about um, whether it was difficult, difficult when you were decided to be a writer that your, your mother who we had here last uh, year and who's in the audience tonight Sheena Mackay was, all, was a successful writer Did, was that intimidating? sort of I don't know really, um, sort of not really, but also, yes, I don't know. Um, she might be yeah, yeah, um, no, um, I, I've got um, my two sisters, Sarah and Cecily, and Cecily's a painter, um, and Sarah, I think, was always the really brainy one, and in a kind of older sister kind of way. Um, and, but we were always just completely encouraged to do whatever it was we wanted to do. And so no, but I knew, I knew very well that the writer's life can be a hard one and you won't necessarily make mega bucks. But I absolutely loved growing up with a mum for a writer and still love having a mum for a writer. And when I came away to university, I really missed the sound of the typewriter keys as it then was. And, um, and of course, completely adore her work and know, and could never, what is intimidating? So I know I could never write like that, but I just have to accept that because um, 
she and my mother's work is so beautiful and so lyrical and she writes such fabulous short stories that I could never write um, but we're just very different writers I mean we have things that we completely agree about I think in our fiction you know the of how you know the things that matter that we write about um, but but we are very different writers too but So I wanted to know how much of perhaps yourself is imbued in the characters you write about, as in whether the characters who are perhaps a direct reflection of you or people you may have known for years gone by, and whether or not that was a conscious decision or something that just came about consciously. Um, I think it, it. I think all the characters are formed separately from each other. Um, sometimes. I, I do, I know, you know, with the men I write that I tend to have these heroes with these outdoor types and, you know, they, um, you know, they work in the Badger Centre or they're a botanist or, um, you know, they do all these sorts of things. Um, but I, I hope that they're all formed individually. I think you, as a writer, you will put in bits of yourself um, into characters and sort of feelings that you have and situations that you understand. For instance, Frank in um, Happy Birthday and all that, um, he's, I think there's actually a huge amount of me in him, but p that people probably wouldn't have realised um, in the way that some of the ways that he sees things, although it probably seemed like the complete opposite. Um, I think a lot of it is also observation and the little things that you notice about people. Guy, who's the central character in A Bit of Earth, um, he started to form in my mind when I just met a friend in the street and just noticed what his eyebrows looked like and, it, and that they just looked like these etiolated little seedlings that had been left too long on a windowsill. And, and the character of Guy sort of started to grow up from seeing my friend's eyebrows. Um, but, and then years later, well, a few years later, after I'd finished it, I was talking to um, a girl I met who'd been to my old school, but years later, she was younger than me. And my favourite biology teacher was still there. And I just suddenly thought, Mr. Grundy. <laughs> and I realised I'd, be, without even thinking of it, I'd put a lot of this nice biology teacher, Mr. Grundy, into into my character guy, and I just hadn't even realised. Um, I think, I know I tend to give characters interests that uh, you sort of explore other lives with your characters. Um, and there's lots of, you know, I would love to have been a botanist. And um, so I think I quite, quite often you give characters jobs and personas of things that you would like to do, like Flora in Happy Birthday and all that. I would love to be that organised and that... Um, you know, good at putting everything in order, but I'm not. And I'd love to be a botanist and, you know, so I think you are sort of trying lots of different things. Um, one thing, I think you have to write about people that you understand, you know, whether they're contemporary characters or characters, you know, a hundred years ago or whatever. So in that way, they have to be connected to you, but they don't have to, but they don't have to be you. Um, and they don't have to be you just sort of dressed up in different clothes. If anything, I think I, I worry that all my characters are too much like me. Oh. Possibly changing things just in case. Yeah. Yeah, but maybe they, yeah, I don't not, know, but. yeah. And does it matter if they are? It probably doesn't matter, I don't know. As, as, as long as um, for each story they're convincingly there, then, and that they work together as a good, useful cast, I don't think, I don't think it really matters. Can you finish up with simply, maybe you could talk about other writers aside from Jane Austen yeah. who have been influential to you? Yeah, well, um, my mum, obviously, whose work I adore, and and grew up, I didn't read it properly when I was very young, um, but I mean, sort of when I was the right age for it, I started reading it. Um, I, I love a writer that, I think another, even before Jane Austen, I really loved Elizabeth Enright's work um, when I was a child growing up. And her novel, Thimble Summer, seems to me to be just the absolute perfect. Have any of you read it or not? 
no, it's the absolute, oh, thank you, <laughs> at the back, yeah. Um, it just seems like a completely perfect novel, um, written in the 30s or 40s, um, and just has such a wonderful use of setting. And um, it's set in, it's Dust Bowl America, and it's this, and I, and I realised later on that so much of my work has actually come from Thimble Summer. Um, she also wrote The Saturdays, which is another wonderful novel for children. And anyway, um, so Elizabeth Enright, um, I hate this thing about where people have this manufactured and, you know, putting, pitting Jane Austen against the Brontes. It's complete garbage. And I, I loved reading the Brontes when I was a teenager as well. You don't have to choose, just have them both. Um, <laughs> And I, when I was, um, I think when I was starting to write, one of the writers who really spoke to me was Laurie Moore, and I, I still really love her work. And a short story of hers, um, How to Become a Writer, I can remember reading that. I was very lucky, I worked at, um, when I was a student, I worked at, um, at a literary agency, my mum's, as, uh, in the days when students got paid to do jobs like that. Um, and they had a proof copy of her first collection of short stories and I took it home and read it on the train and I was just laughing my head off at it and just absolutely loved it. Um, and I love her snappy dialogue, it's wonderful. Um, I really love Antalya's novels and she's someone that I will just rush out to buy in um, hardback the moment they're out as well. I, I, I like reading books about families a lot. Really see the anti-influence. Oh, very much. yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, thank you very much, Rebecca. It's been really wonderful. Thank you.